this is the last lecture from uh, section 7, or chapter 7, uh, the appendix of it anyway. And we're talking about design tools, and uh, in particular here we're going to just briefly touch on some hardware description languages, and, and that'll be uh, VHDL. You've already got lots of exposure to Verilog through the labs, and in particular the, the labs that you're doing on the Altera website. But anyway, as an alternative, as many of you probably are aware, because I think you've used it in some other courses, there is VHDL. It's been around a little bit longer, uh, 1987, and... Uh, it is a, a high-level HDL like Verilog, uh, similar to other programming languages. Um, it again, it, it can distinguish between signals and variables, and it has nice support for parameterized descriptions. So, as you'd expect, it supports a structural description, uh, data flow descriptions, behavioral descriptions. Uh, just move on a little bit now to design interchange formats. Well, you can think of an HDL as a, a design interchange format because it is at a relatively high level and relatively easy to recompile into another technology. Uh, but there are also uh, very specific design interchange uh, languages that are used to describe design information as well. Um, and they're typically more oriented to be machine readable. Uh, EDIF is one that we uh, talked about just briefly before. And it's a, it's a syntactically similar to Lisp. And, and as a consequence, it's relatively easy to process lists, which you'd find uh, many components of a, an IC design uh, are amenable to lists. Uh, anyway, so just briefly go through that. There's a couple different levels, uh, supports for different design views, a netlist schematic, uh, symbolic mask layout, uh, and all of those are the idea behind it was EDIF would be able to support uh, anything at those different levels. Uh, if you're at a relatively low level, there's this uh, GDS2. It's a first interchange format and probably the most supported format by IC CAD tools at the low level. So it does support um, uh, basically layout uh, uh, information and it's a de facto standard in that area. I'll just uh, talk a little bit about behavioral synthesis. It's just a brief sampling of it. But the purpose of behavioral synthesis tools is to take a specification of a designer's behavior and produce a structural implementation. So you say what the circuit does, and the tools make the circuit. And that's what you'd expect, basically, from, from writing code in any event. So the basic objectives of transform behavioral description to the structural descriptions is to reduce design times, which that might be obvious, and perhaps more importantly, reduce design errors. Now, these designs are so complex that, that really you can't do that by uh, too many other means. Uh, synthesis also allows you to readily explore design alternatives that you wouldn't be able to if you were... Uh, let's say using a schematic for a you know, multi-thousand number of uh, gates. Uh, documentation is also more easily incorporated into higher level descriptions and um, the behavioral synthesis process typically is divided into three steps. You have a task definition, scheduling, and allocation and we'll look at a brief example of that here. Uh, again, the goal is to uh, take your algorithm and produce uh, a structural description which is uh, typically an RTL, register transfer level. So a task definition, you read an input behavioral description, could be in C, VHDL, Verilog, or some other uh, uh, language. And you want to produce typically an internal representation, which is going to be a graph of some type. And then basically design is, is converted into two graphical representations, control flow information and data flow information. So here's a simple example of uh, computing the square root of a number using Newton's method. It's probably a fairly old example that's used in a lot of different uh, uh, synthesis examples. So some optimizations may be performed on this algorithm to remove some efficiencies. And here's an example where if there was a, a multiplication by 0.5, that would just be a simple shift, shift operation. And shifting would be a little bit simpler than multiplying. Uh, and those types of optimizations are similar to those that are, you'd find in optimizing compiler. So here's an example of the, the control flow and precedence uh, constraints on this particular chunk of code. It was a bit of Pascal code written for a square root. And here's uh, it broken into uh, a data flow and control. It's a task, and these are the tasks that are defined. So multiplication, addition, such as uh, things like that. So it identifies what can be done in parallel. And for example, uh, this the number i over here. Since it goes up to three, you realize that it could be uh, uh, done with two bits, and a comparison to zero. Uh, if you did brute force scheduling, that's sort of what happens when. Uh, deciding, like I said, when uh, the operations and the control flow graphs are to be performed. Uh, you assign operations during these steps and uh, things may have to be scheduled because there'd be limited resources. So for example, if you only one functional uh, data and control unit, well you'd need 24 control steps and that's looking at that previous figure in through here. So many steps here, 
so many here, so many here, and these are re repeated three times. So brute force, one after the other would take 24. Uh, here's uh, this is another schematic of the what we're talking about when we're controlling things. We have uh, uh, some memory that we can put things in a functional functional unit, and then some input from the outside, and maybe reapplying the 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 data that we're processing during the during the iteration. So here's an example of the scheduling with the data fl uh, flow only shown here, uh, not the control part. And uh, we can see that if we uh, optimize it in some fashion such that we can do two, at least two things at once, we'd end up with the control steps would take uh, in this you know, somewhat optimized fashion, maybe 15 control steps as opposed to 24 because on step four, for example, two are taken. On step three, two are taken. So time step five, two are taken. So time step six, one is taken. So uh, basically you know, reduces uh, the number of steps, but you require more hardware. And that's always the trade-off that you'll tend to encounter. So the actual process of assigning hardware to the operations, uh, of course, the simplest algorithm would basically unroll everything, apply a separate piece of hardware to each operation, but that wouldn't be very efficient at all. Um, at which point in time, you also have to consider other constraints that are placed upon the allocation algorithm, such as timing, for example. So here's an example of the of the allocation part. Um, this is where we actually set aside. Well, we need to do a, a, a uh, an addition, we have to do an addition, we have to do a multiplication, we have to do a shift operation, uh, have to do a, a division, uh, things of that nature. So once the schedule and data paths are chosen, a uh, controller needs to be synthesized and typically the har uh, it's hardware control and the control step corresponds to a state in a finite state machine. So once the I.O. to data path are determined during allocation, the control finite state machine can be created with you know, known methods for creating finite state machines. So if not obvious, this high-level synthesis is done with synthesis tools uh, in particular, and rarely is this ever done by hand. So some future design tools. Uh, well, as I see, designs get larger and more complex. Of course, new design automation tools will be required, or at least more new and improved. Uh, really high-level behavioral synthesis tools are still an open area of research, uh, although there are a number of commercial tools that do synthesis from high-level behavioral descriptions, and we'll briefly touch about them upon that in a minute or two. Uh, there's also emerging tools that help help a person verify the function. So similar, these are similar to well-written code that catch up exceptions and and allow you to uh, do some higher-level uh, simulation, if you like, without having to worry about it being uh, synthesizable. Uh, also, there's lots of work doing uh, people working on analog design tools, and in 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 addition to that, as you know, design speeds get higher and higher, people are putting more emphasis on electromagnetic compatibility, electromagnetic magnetic compatibility, and issues of that nature, crosstalk, and things like which are really analog things that you want to be able to uh, determine about your uh, digital design. Uh, HDLs typically they tend to incorporate some testing techniques in the synthesis of a circuit. Uh, currently, it's it's still up to the designer to specify test structures, but new tools are being developed that incorporate these automatically. In some cases, they already do. For example, you may uh, specify your design using a standard flip-flop, and later on, that design will be replaced with a flip-flop with some testing capabilities. Uh, with FPGAs, some test scenarios are not required as you're already using a tested chip. At least that's you know what you hear with SPA, uh, if FPGA vendors. But clearly, you still have to do some testing on your design itself. Uh, anyway, some of the takeaways from this section, uh, not much done by hand or back of the envelope anymore. There's specialized tools at every level, the physical layer, the layout, the DRC, the back annotation, to go from your layout to your simulators, your, your, your place and route uh, tools. At the circuit level, you have analog simulation for very precise timing information. At RTL, you have logic simulation, basically functional type simulation, maybe a little bit of information regarding delay. Uh, synthesis tools, you have something like uh, take your Verilog description and produce a, an RTL. And uh, verification, uh, although we just briefly touched on it, basically you end up uh, writing a test bench, which are basically non-synthesizable wrappers that, that uh, test your uh, uh, design, but not necessarily been uh, synthesizable with synthesizable code. So in that first assignment that you did, you actually wrote a test bench for that 2-bit arbiter, if you recall. And it's uh, time to take a break.